right, just letting it run for a second. Let's make sure that uh, we got it actually streaming onto Twitch. Waiting for Twitch to catch up. All right, and it looks like we are indeed live. So welcome everyone to the next panel at CouchCon. This one is gonna be all about character design. And I've got some notes written down, I've got some pictures to look at, so we'll go ahead and jump into it together. Character design, do 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 do. Let's see, let's get display capture up there. There we go. All right. Yes, I've got I've got some samples available as well. So, character design. First, let me start off with my little spiel. Um, a lot of people have described character design as something that can be a little bit of a you know it can go wrong. There can be mistakes when it comes to designing your character, and there's a lot of latitude based on what style you're doing stuff in. I mean the the variation of styles from like South Park to you know Akira. There's there's a very wide range, but even so, it's possible to do character design wrong. And let me just pull up a little sample here. I think you'll all kind of recognize this from recent internet fame, uh, Sonic vs. Sonic. And it's taken him a minute to pop up, but I'll tell you what you're going to see as soon as it pops up. Uh, there's a before image and then an after image. And the before image, uh, it just doesn't look quite right. It's a little, it's a little disturbing. And in fact, for me, I think it becomes even more clear the further out you zoom from this image. It's just, uh, when you're zoomed way out here, you can see one of these looks like a strange small child with, uh, with encephalitis or something. And the other one looks more dynamic, it's got more shaping characteristics, it's got more style. Yet on the surface, they look pretty similar. So what is it about them that makes one a bad character design and one a much better character design? Well, let's jump into some of that. Um, Let's see, and the, another t possible title for this could be How to Design a Character So It Does Not Look Like Something That Was Barfed Up by a Clown. Because I know, especially in the furry community, sometimes they have issues where you'll get someone designing their character, and they put every color they can think of, and then some new colors on that character, and they have like 15 piercings and 5 tattoos, and each eye is a different color, and then each fingernail is a different color, and then they have a secret message from their grandma written on one arm, and... You know, it's just, by the time it's done, it sort of looks like a gigantic pile of, uh, of clutter, and that's also not a good character design. So there's one idea that is going to be coming up repeatedly as I talk about the elements of a good character design, and that idea is primary, counterpart, and accent. And it's sort of a universal principle, but it's very handy, I've noticed, for a lot of character design elements. So when I say primary, I mean it's, it's also used in design language where you have a primary feature, and then you have a secondary feature that is subservient to the primary, but it still provides a bit of a counterpoint. And then there's like a little tiny accent. So three levels, pretty simple, but those ideas will pop up periodically, so here we go. First of all, when I'm designing a character, uh, people have given us some kind compliments about the character design in the story. So I'm actually going to go back to the original lineup. This is where I first designed uh, the characters. And I mean... Individually, I sketched and drew them out here and there, and they sort of evolved in sketchbooks over time. But before Volume 1 started, when I was sitting down and getting ready to actually put the comic together, I drew each character out and put them in this lineup, and this is actually where all the final colors were chosen, you know, when I could see how they looked together as a group. Because that's one thing to keep in mind when you're designing a character is, like, you're not just designing a character in isolation. You know, if it's for a project, if it's for a comic or an animation or something like that, you're usually designing them in the context of an existing cast, or you're, you might be designing a new cast from the ground up. And so you've got to have them fit in with everybody else, but at the same time be very distinctive from everyone else. And probably the biggest rule of thumb, this is such a simple idea, but it stuck with me ever since uh, art college. The biggest rule of thumb is when you line up all your characters together, if you could only see the silhouette, you want to be able to identify who is who based only on the silhouette. So, without any color, without any interior detail, without any facial expressions, anything like that, you should be able to tell who that character is. And I mean, uh, with Dream Keepers, I was trying to go for that, and I feel like I've, you know, hopefully been improving over time, but you can still see pretty easily which characters are which. That's obviously Randy, we got Mace, Whip, Paige, Bass, Lilith. If you know the series, then you can recognize these characters from their silhouette very, very easily. So, that's the first big rule of thumb. Is, and I think this goes for any style too, because if you have even a bunch of realistic characters, you want to have something about them that makes them set off, you know. And I'll do a little bit of doodling here because doodling is fun. 
You know, you might think, oh, with realistic proportions and realistic characters, I can't have fun, crazy silhouettes. And I mean, it is a little more difficult. That's part of why Dream Keepers, I made the cartoon characters animalistic, because with animalistic characters, you can have tails, you can have ears or horns or wings or all sorts of ways for them to stand out. And you might think with a human, you know, how are you going to make a human silhouette stand out or be different? Well, I mean, if you watch any anime, one big way is some hair. And I think we all recognize, like, with hair like this, it's not the best done, but it's probably something Goku-esque. We can draw another little face here. <laughs> and, yeah. We don't know exactly what character this is, but he's some form of Super Saiyan. Odds are. So, even if with a human character, you can use exaggerated hair. You can use, uh, also, overall body build, which is another thing to think about. You know, even if you're using human characters, they're very realistic. Not everyone has the same build and the same proportions, and you really, in fact, hopefully if you have a good style, you might be able to uh, exaggerate that a little bit. You might get some guy who's, uh, let me put a little transparency on there, some guy who's really big and dumpy, and he's got like burly arms, like, you know, like hams with like the hair on there, and maybe he's a butcher, he's kind of glowering, and he's got like a big, big steak knife in this hand. So, yeah, we can exaggerate this guy a little bit. And uh, the lower legs are pretty short because he doesn't run a lot, so it looks like all the weight just kind of like settles in down there. So yeah, even with realistic human characters, this isn't necessarily very realistic, but I mean, it's not completely unrealistic. You can go to Walmart and see exactly this without the butcher knife. And you might get some people that are the opposite. They're going to be very tall and lanky. You know, something like a, like a distance runner or maybe a slender man type of people. Uh, maybe a pianist, a concert pianist, who is uh, so obsessed with his craft and with practicing the piano that he never takes time out to eat. So you can have, and then again, if you had like a series and you had these two characters in it, if you popped them out as silhouettes, you'd be able to tell which is which very easily. And you don't necessarily have to make your silhouettes stand out from all characters in existence ever, as long as when people are watching your show or reading your comic, your silhouette for important characters at least reads very clearly from the rest so so I'd say that is that is the biggest rule of thumb that is probably gonna help you the most if you're designing especially a cast of characters is you wanna have nice nice defined nice recognizable silhouettes so and that's what I was doing when I was thinking you know back when I was building up the Dreamkeepers cast is I was thinking in terms of animation because initially I kinda wanted it to be an animated show and for reasons of creative control I decided okay I'm gonna make it a comic instead but even so, I was still thinking in terms of, you know, having something that looks animated. And I think even if you're not going for animation, even if you're going for an illustration or a comic book or something like that, I think it helps to think in terms of animation. Because another thing you want with your character design is you want to have things be relatively simple. And by simple, I mean you don't want to just like cover them with like lots and lots and lots of pointless detail. And the reason for that is because if you have a character that's got tons of detail on their entire surface... Um, it's, you know, it can be visually pretty cluttery, but also it's not memorable. If you want people to remember your character, it has to be something that they can remember. I mean, looking at, uh, Vanth here, she's got, like, some ears and hair and wings going on, but besides that, we don't put a whole ton of unnecessary detail on. Bast has his sharp little pointy ears, his little back fins. We don't put a whole ton of unnecessary detail on. And, uh, yeah, we want them to be pretty memorable, so little bluey-gray Batgirl, that's, those are some pretty big, simple details, but it's enough to stick in your head. And the neon knives actually generally go away from this a little bit, and that's because, if you'll notice, in fact, Vanth is one of the simplest characters in this particular lineup, because she is one of the primary characters, she's the main character, so she has actually kind of less detail. She's got those big, blue, open space areas on her wings. Uh, she doesn't have a ton of ornamentation, she just has a basic sweater and pants with one detail, those rings, so that she can hook in there with her, uh, you know, hands that aren't quite hands. But uh, aside from that, she doesn't have a whole lot of extraneous detail. Whereas these other characters, the Neon Knives, a lot of them are more background or side characters, and they have these different tattoo areas and shaved parts and body paint and bracelets and rings and slashes. And the reason that they have more detail is because they're supposed to be, they're, they're characters, yes, but they're almost... It, because they're background characters they can almost serve as almost as like a part of the setting and especially since they're background characters we don't need them to pop and be as memorable in a distinct way like they can be more of like a general like blur of like oh i remember these guys had a lot of neon colors on a lot of like chains and jewelry and things like that 
So the neon knives are almost more about their props and things. But that's an example where generally if you want your main cast to be something that people remember, something that people can be like, oh yeah, I know what Sonic looks like, you know, scribble it on a napkin. Like some of these guys, if people read the comic, I would not expect them to be able to scribble them onto a napkin from memory. But you go over here to like Mason Whip, and Mason Whip, especially Whip, that's a lot simpler. Their main characters, and the simplicity is part of the design because simplicity, not only is it often more visually pleasing to look at, not only does it make your production time go faster because, trust me, after I designed Center and I realized he was going to be in more than one scene and I started putting him in more scenes, it was like, oh boy. He, he kind of slows things down when he pops up. So simplicity works for you in a couple ways. It makes your characters more memorable. It makes your production time faster. And uh, what else do I have on my little notes here about simplicity? That tons of details can water down visual impact. If it's simple, it's relatable, it's viable. And for our final conclusion on that topic, let me go to the example here. All right, I don't know why it takes this thing so long to load. But anyways, here you have Garfield, and you can see him, and within a split second, you know exactly what character he is, you've seen him a million times, and one of the reasons that he functions so good as a character is because he's very, very simple. Like, say what you will about whether you like the Garfield comics, but this is a character design that uses a lot of the same shaping characteristics. you got oval eyes, oval nose, oval head, there's like a lot of rounded shapes here. And he's very simple. He's got a very simple color scheme. There's not a whole lot of extraneous detail. And the only detail that there really is, which is these stripes, is a, it's mirrored so many times that it com becomes more of a motif than like an individual thing that you must remember. So that's a pretty simple character design. Now we're going to go to the other end of the spectrum and we're looking at Spider Jerusalem from Transmetropolitan. And again, you look at him... And obviously this is a totally different style, not nearly as cartoony, very gritty, lots of detail in the style, but even though it's a realistic and detailed style, look at the character, he's pretty simple. If you had to draw Spider Jerusalem from memory, you can remember he wears all black, he's a bare chested underneath an open black shirt, he's bald, he's got a spider tattoo on his forehead, and he's got these funky glasses, a rectangle and a circle, one is green and one is red. I mean, those are very simple things to remember. If you see a glimpse of this guy in an image anywhere, you're instantly going to remember it because these are some very simple things. Rectangle, circle, green, red. You know, no no undershirt, bare-chested, spider tattoo, wears black. We get it. I mean, the cigarette isn't always a part of his character, but like 90% of the time. That's his favorite prop, I'd say. So, but that just shows that even if you have a more detailed style, you still want to try to strip away detail like detail that doesn't add anything to the character if there's details on your character and it's not adding anything and not telling you about the character in any significant way then it's probably just detracting from having a memorable character for your audience all right going back over here so what do i got tons of details not the best simple equals memorable think in terms of animation also i would say think in terms of literature for people that are maybe coming from a writing background one of the tricks in literature is, if you're writing a novel and you've got a few characters in your novel, you want to have a few description tags that you completely, that you repeatedly come back to for those characters. Like if you've got a character who's got like tall, icy blue eyes and a very, very, like maybe he's got a slumped back, even though he's tall, it's like he's constantly slumped over, like he's depressed about something and it's like fueling his angst or something like that. But the point is, every time that character pops up, you don't want to word it exactly the same way, but you want to hit those same um, kind of visceral details when you're writing in a novel for a character. And just like a, a good literary character has a few distinct traits that need to be hit upon and uh, impressed upon for the reader to really get a visual of that character, any character that you're drawing, you know, for a comic or something, you should have a few distinct traits. Like Bast, he's almost always got this red scarf on, and he's pointy and pokey. Uh, here we have Harmony, and Harmony has got these pastel colors that kind of come together nicely. She's very lanky, but she's got big wings and curly antenna. So having, having a few very simple handles, both from an animation standpoint and then coming at it from a different direction, from like a literary standpoint, it can, it can kind of help you in terms of how you're thinking of your character design. All right, so we talked about complexity, we talked about simplicity. Now let's talk about the simple primary foundational ingredients of your character design. And those are going to be color, shape, posture, and personality. And posture is actually interesting. Let me write these things down here in order. 
color is obviously going to be important unless you're doing something in black and white. Shape is very important. In fact, that thing I mentioned about silhouettes that are recognizable, that's entirely contingent on shape, or at least almost entirely. Another thing here is posture, but posture isn't even its own category so much as it is a bridge between, po between shape and personality. Because you do want to design the character's personality when you are designing how they look, because they're probably going to affect one another. So, uh, what do we want to talk about first? Color is probably the simplest to talk about first. And this is where that primary, counterpart, and accent idea comes in. Primary, secondary, accent. I also like counterpart and accent. And for uh, someone like Bast, we'll just look at some examples. His primary color is going to be like this high contrast brown and white. And the red, I would say, is a very important accent. Or actually, no, that's, uh, that's more of the counterpoint is the red. And then the accent is that warm golden glow in his eyes. For someone like uh, Vanth, her primary colors are going to be, I would say, it's like the gray and the blue, the gray and the teal mixed in there. And then a, a counterpoint color, we can just mix in whatever we need to, like a nice, uh, a nice jacket color so the clothing can be a counterpoint. And then the accent is she's got pink eyes, which is a different color. And you kind of want to go with colors that are, what do I want to say? You don't want to, you don't want to have like too many directions on the color wheel. And if you've never seen a color wheel, uh, they're handy. I would say Mace is another good example. In fact, this is the original cast, and if you notice, every character has a very, a very distinct punchy color scheme. Mace has got warm tones. He's got like a, like a cream and a brown. His jacket is like a very rich, almost like yellowy earth tone color. He's got earth tone shorts. So Mace's primary color scheme is warm earth tones. And then if you look at anything, if you can find anything on him that's not a warm earth tone, it's pretty much the eyes, and the eyes are a deep blue. And if you have a warm color, blue is the counterpoint. So that's, that's Mace. He's got basically warm earth tones as the primary color scheme, and then a counterpoint, which is the blue. For Whip, Whip is almost the opposite. Whip is almost entirely blue. He's got a dark blue patch, light blue body. Uh, the cream is just kind of goes along with the blue because it's very much in the same, you know, in the same sort of a strata. And then I guess the counterpoint on Whip is going to be those, actually the red eyes. The red eyes are a nice accent. I guess for the counterpoint on Whip, that, that big pink ear is sort of a counterpoint. But it all goes together. Like if this ear was like a blazing red, it would be very different. With Bast, we do have some blazing red. I would say with Bast, the red is one of his primary color colors in the graphic novel, especially because he got the, the gloves and the leggings that match the scarf. So in the graphic novel rendition, red is the primary color for Bast, and then the accent, again, is going to be those fiery little eyes. Lilith is primarily green, Nam is primarily purple, but if you, that's, I think, the important thing to look at when you're looking at a whole cast and when you're thinking about color, each character has their own distinct color. Like Mace is browns, Whip is blue, Bast is red, Lilith is green, Nama is purple. And the colors are like, you know, they're arranged so that as a group they still look good together. They look like they belong in the same fictional series. They don't look like they completely don't match. But they all have their own distinct color and that really helps visually set them apart. I mean, if you flip open a page, even if the character's in some kind of a weird pose where their silhouette doesn't read well, um, you can tell immediately from the color who's who. So. Especially when you're designing a whole cast, you want to make sure that the characters don't all have the exact same color scheme, unless there's a very good reason for them to have the exact same color scheme. In fact, an area where I designed them to kind of have the same color scheme was over here in the neon knives, because I wanted them all to have relatively neutral tones and then neon uh, body markings, or very bright fluorescing body markings. And you know, when the, light, when the lights turn down, the fluorescent stuff stands out a lot more. So you see here, most of their primary colors are relatively neutral. Even guys with like a warmer orangey tone, like uh, like Sligit here, it's not very chromatic. The chroma is turned down, and the chroma is turned down on all these characters on purpose so that the neon stuff pops a little more. But again, the neon knives, they're kind of designed in the series to act more as like a group or a gang of characters. They are individuals, but for the purposes of the story, they kind of act as a group of people, and that's why their color scheme is almost designed for them to sort of not stand out from one another so much, because their whole gang operates around, you know, gangs do things together, they have the same symbols, they wear the same colors, and so that's a point where, you know, maybe you don't want every character in the cast to have a totally different color design if there's supposed to be some sort of conformity or uniformity going on. 
But then, of course, we do have Vanth being different from them. She's the only one with that color blue in the whole entire group. And she's also the only one that doesn't really have the neon markings to that degree. I think Scythe also doesn't have neon markings, but he's got big old stripes, so he kind of gets away with it. All right, so color. I talked about color a little bit. I talked about compare everything in your cast. Everything in your cast, if you have a cast of characters, everything is measured relative to what it is next to. So you do want to have some variety. Everything should look like it belongs together, but you want there to be variety. So that was one of our big ingredients, color. And again, the main key for color is you want to choose... Don't give me error messages, Photoshop. You want to choose... I'm not using the clone tool. I must have hit a button somewhere. You want to choose one primary color. For Mace, the primary would be earth tones. For Bass, the primary would be red. For Lilith, the primary would be green. You want to choose one primary because there's if just you know that's what the word primary means it is the prime you can only have one thing that is the most important thing in a set of things so you gotta choose one primary color you don't necessarily want to have something else competing for that primary color and then if you have a character especially if they're a main character of some time sometime then you want to have a, a counterpoint or a, yeah a counterpoint color so mace has got those earth tones but then we need a counterpoint in there to give them a little bit of, you know, because if a character is all warm tones, it can kind of be a little suffocating almost. So we give them those bright blue eyes to give you a nice cool counterpoint. And of course, there's always room for a little accent here and there just to spice things up. But that's why you want to have things in sort of a hierarchy with the primary color being dominant. Because if there is no primary color, if there's like five you know two to five different colors and they're all competing for who's the primary color you run into the phenomenon where it might look like it was barfed up by a clown and you don't want that i mean generally unless unless that's the unless that's the theme of the character all right and the next major characteristic when you come to character design is shape and we already talked about that a little bit in terms of wanting to have recognizable silhouettes and yet, even as you can see here for anyone that's read the comic and they're familiar with the characters they can tell which character is which just at a glance from the silhouettes. But let's talk a little bit more about shape. Um, I would say Bast is a good example. He's got a lot of pointy triangle shapes. So just like with color, sometimes you want to have a character that has an overall theme for their shape. And with Bast, the theme is, you know, it kind of fits his personality too, incidentally. Very pointy, very triangly, and then of course his tail is just a big mass of pointy triangly things. So even in a quick little doodle like this, you know, you can tell that's Bast. He's the guy that's got all the pointy triangles jutting out of his design. And then for someone like Mace, his primary uh, thing is more of like a big squarish shaped head. So none, none of the other characters really have a head quite as square shaped as Mace. He's got a square head with a little ear coming off there, some cheek tufts, a little bit of hair. But his, that's his primary thing is he's got a head that's very squared off, very blunt. And he doesn't have a lot of other sharp, jagged shapes on him. Everything else is pretty organic. Even his tail is kind of a big fluffy raccoon tail. So you got triangle over here, you got square over here. Then if you look at Lilith, she's got a nice circular head shape, very organic, with some ears on it. And she has some other circular shapes too in various various areas. I don't think I need to completely spell it out. Boobs. And then the rest of her shape is it's just pretty organic, pretty fluid. So we could say that a circle is a good foundational shape for her. Nama is, where's Nama? Nama's over here somewhere. Nama's also got a nice circular head, but she's got a nice little devil tail and some pointy horns that are a lot pointier than Bast's. But the point is, like, just like you're going to have different variety in the coloration of your character lineup, if you're doing, if you're doing like, a show or a cast for a comic, you also want to have variation in the shaping qualities of characters. Like, you don't necessarily want every single character to be super spiky and pointy. You don't want every character to have, like, a squared off, like, head, and or every character to be nothing but organic shapes. You want to have some variety and some variation in there, because that's going to help make those silhouettes pop a lot different. Like, even, again, let's do some examples of just regular humans. Even if we're just having regular humans, maybe we've got a guy who's got, like, more angular cheekbones, and he's a little more frowny. And to complete it, we'll give him like you know wide sort of angular shoulders, and then we could even have his posture be more. He tends to be more angular when, in the way he carries himself and holds himself. You know, here we have him folding his arms and stuff like that. And then we might have someone else who, and we don't even have to make a total exaggeration like, oh, this is an obese man. Hello. You know, 
Like we can even use organic shaping characteristics with another guy who's reasonably well in shape. We can have him here. He doesn't have to be like overweight or unhealthy. We could have him still be like, you know, pretty strong, pretty buff. Maybe he's even in a similar pose, but he's a little more laid back about it. He's, he's also folding his arms. But just because of the shaping characteristics, this guy, we're going to have him be more angular. And even in the little, like, you know, abbreviated facial expressions I've got here, he's got angular eyes, a pointy nose. This guy, he's going to have more of a, just the shaping characteristic is going to be a lot more organic. So already, just by the just by the way these guys are put together, they look different. They have a different feel. They have a different attitude. Um, you can see once you get the detail filled in on them, and they were finished with like you know the same sort of line weight, the same sort of line style, that sort of thing. They would look like they belong in the same story together, but they have a very different look because one of them is built with angular shaping characteristics, and one of them is built with organic shaping characteristics. So just like you want to have variation in the different colors of a cast. You want to have variation, too, in the shaping characteristics that sort of define them and sort of define their silhouette. So there's that. So we've covered color. We've covered, covered shape. Uh, posture, I would say, is almost the thing that bridges the gap between shape and personality. So we're just going to let that be a weird middle zone, and it's going to be based you know, also on how the character's feeling. So we're going to go right over now to personality. Personality is... Um, that's going to determine what the character's attitude is, and the attitude, again, feeds back into their posture, which feeds back into the shaping characteristics of their body and their silhouette. So personality should be a consideration when you're thinking about what character is shaped what, which way and why are they shaped that way. And that doesn't mean that your character can only have one emotion that they ever feel, but again, it means that they have a primary attitude, a primary sort of emotional tone, and then... If they're a main character, I mean, if they're if they're like a background character, if it's like some guy selling waffles and you never see him again, you don't necessarily want to take every background character and invest them with like the primary attitude and then a counterpoint and then he has a, an internal conflict in how he sells the waffles and we have to get into like the motivation in his history as of why is he a waffle seller and how does he feel about you know, you get the idea. If it's just a secondary or a background character. Sometimes a primary emotional tone is all they need, and you don't need to get more in depth because it's not relevant to the story. But, especially if you're doing a story with a little more depth, you do want to have primary and counterpoint and accent personality features in your main cast. Because if they don't have some sort of var variation in their makeup, they're going to seem very dull and one-dimensional. So, you want to have a primary emotional tone, but then as the reader you know continues in the story and they learn more you do want to give them some internal conflict you do want to give them some counterpoints and some some variation from what they can be but just to again look at our main cast from an overview uh, if you want to look at the primary emotional tone mace tends to be more idealistic and hopeful and energetic and also a little bit of a fumbling fool at times uh, whip is more suave he's a little bit more of a, of a player Paige is innocent and young and fresh-faced. Bast is brooding and aggressive. Lilith is uh, book smart and maybe naive, but very well-intentioned and very, very by the rules, very by the book. Nama is, you know, the rebel, wild child, sarcastic, quippy. So they each have a very distinct primary emotional tone. And then, of course, as you read the story, you're going to find out that that's not the only gear in their clock. There's other things at work. There's counterpoints. There's variation. There's stuff like that. But I would say... When you're first sitting down to design a cast of characters that work together, um, you're probably not going to be designing the nuance first. Because, I mean, nuance, the nuances of what? So, at least for me, when I sat down, first I got a very basic, you could even say stereotypical, emotional tone for all the primary characters. And then once you have a basic emotional direction, a primary emotional tone... After that, it's easy to go in and then be like, and then here's the counterpoint, here's the exception, here's where they get a little complexity, here's where they're conflicted about the way they are. So I would say, at least for me, starting out, you want to give each character a different emotional tone from the other characters, and then it's a lot easier to go in after that and start you know, building some subtlety and some layers in there. So what else do I have written down about personality? Uh, motivation, their constant driving force. Um, the motivation is what will take a character and actually um, force them to participate in the plot. 
because if they don't have a motivation, there's no reason for them to do anything. So I would say that's another thing to think about. Even in the early design stages of a character, even if you don't have a whole lot written yet, try to think about what is driving them and why. And I know that this is veering away from visual character design and into story and writing, but the two do have a very important connection because, again, who your character is, why they're motivated, that might make a difference regarding like what kind of tools or props they have. It might make a difference in terms of how they dress or how they carry themselves or how they've developed. And again, motivation is probably the most important thing to bear in mind when you're writing a character. You got to know what is driving them and why they're acting because that's one of the one thing I learned in college that was very useful from ironically an acting course. It was, you know, uh, an extra thing. It wasn't really in the curriculum, but they drilled in there Everyone always has a motivation. Anytime anyone does anything, nobody does stuff for no reason. Even if they don't know what it is, there is a motivation, and they're going to act on that motivation until that motivation changes. So I, th I think it's an important part of character design. You have to know what is driving your characters and why is it driving them. And especially if you're designing a cast, um, they might have some similar motivations, but you don't want them to all have the same exact motivation. And, you know... A motivation is something that's a little deeper and more internal. It's not necessarily a scene-specific goal, like, oh, the boat is sinking. We don't want the boat to sink. It's like, oh, they all have the same motivation. How about, you know, like, no, they all have the same short-term goal, but what the, that, that's just an obstacle between them and the thing that they are pursuing. It's like the thing that they woke up in the morning with the hopes of pursuing was not necessarily... Well, I sure hope the boat doesn't sink at 3 p.m., and if it does, then that's going to be what I want to do is prevent it from sinking. You know, the boat sinking is just an obstacle, and the thing that they are trying to get over obstacles in the pursuit of, that's the overarching motivation. All right, so we've talked about color, we've talked about shape, we've talked about how silhouettes and distinct silhouettes are good, we've talked about how having distinct personalities and distinct emotional tones, primary emotional tones, is also good for your cast. So I guess uh, now I'm just going to talk about don't be afraid to use archetypes. And this actually came up earlier when I was in the stream with Gio as well. Don't necessarily be afraid to start off with basic archetypes for your characters, like a, a kindly grandma or like a, a burly warrior. Uh, just because archetypes exist and they're recognizable does not mean that they are inherently bad or lazy. They can be. They can be used lazily. But, I mean, we have these uh, archetypes around for a reason. It's because they're relatable. So just because other people have done something with it doesn't mean you can't do something new with it or put a new twist on it. And I've often said it's kind of similar to looking at a car rolling down the street and then be like, oh, wheels, how cliche. It's like, yeah, b because that's what makes it work. If you don't have that on, like, I guess you can make a real original car with triangular wheels, but it wouldn't, it wouldn't function very well. So, yeah, so I'm saying... uh. There's a lot of people that are like, oh, that's just a stereotype or a cliche or an archetype. And it's like, that, that. I mean, it doesn't inherently make it bad if somebody can recognize that there's an archetypal or mythological influence. So, I mean, it can be done lazily, but it's like anything. It can be done good. It can be done bad. But don't necessarily be afraid of the tool just because some people can identify that it was a tool that was used in the job. All right. So, yeah, and when it comes to character design, if you're having trouble getting started, if you don't really have a good direction to go from, if you're having trouble getting inspiration, sometimes it helps to think of, like, different seasons of the year, like springtime, winter, fall, and base a character based off of that personality, or think about, like, the elements, like fire, ice, water. You know, there's, there's a lot of different ways that you can sort of jumpstart your creativity and find a new way to approach things or whet your appetite for creating characters, and yeah. I hope that this has been a little bit useful. If you have questions, go ahead and pop them into the Twitch chat. So I'm going to go over there now, and I'm going to look and answer any questions that you might have before we wrap up for tonight. All right. Hello, Twitch chat. Wait, are you sponsored by Sony? I am. I am not sponsored by Sony, but apparently, if I was to guess, Twitch makes money with Sony by putting free roll in front of these streams. So that's what I would guess is going on. Hello everyone, who's the one on the far right? Some random Sabaton Tower Guard. Yeah, that, that guy on the far right was actually designed before uh, the Guard Trio was officially designed. That was very, very early concept, pre-Volume 1 concept. Excuse me. 
Do, 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 do. Van, Vance Dad satchel charge. Yes, he does. He does have a satchel. If you call it a purse, he might get a little a little offended. Someone immediately in the chat called it a purse, <laughs> so he'd probably be a little offended. But uh, he prefers to call it a satchel. Sometimes you have trouble getting V's pattern right. Yeah, I'm not the the 100% best at always staying on model. I try to, but I also want my style to kind of flex and grow and hopefully improve as I move forward. So I should be on character model a little bit better. Liz helps a lot, but that's one of the things that I'm trying to get good at is being more consistent with being on model with characters. But again, sometimes I sometimes I let myself be a little more loose because I do want to let my style hopefully develop to a degree as I go forward. Uh, Vat asks, any characters from others, from other comics or fans or media you can pull from your head who's memorable? Um, honestly, just from a visual standpoint and a personality, Goku is pretty memorable. I know he's like the big super popular thing, but I mean, look at that hair. Once you see Goku's hair, you can never unsee it. He runs around in a blazing orange jumpsuit, and he's super happy and positive about everything. So, and I know that's his primary emotional tone, and then sometimes he might get angry if, you know, you kill Gohan or Krillin. Well, not really Krillin, if you kill Gohan or something. So, so yeah, I would say Goku, he might not be the most complex character of all time, but in terms of a simple, memorable character, he's a success story. What are Vance's parents' names? I'm not sure if we've actually made up their specific names yet. I'd have to check my notes. What? We have not. Oh, Liz confirms we have not. So, so far, we relate to Vant's parents the way Vanth does, which is mom and dad. Um, I'm sure they do have names, but we haven't uh, gone to the trouble of making them up yet, because so far they haven't been in a situation where the story needed to know what their names are. So, it's still in the fog of war. Do, 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 do. Especially when several characters get introduced in quick succession in literature, I cannot remember who all these new people are without a separate dramatist persona if there's too much going on with them. It's a good note from Chimera Dragon Fang. Um, someone says, I gotta go. Will these panels be on video? Uh, yes, I am recording, hopefully. So if all the technical stuff works, I should be able to post these up to YouTube and BitChute later. And someone mentions you can find them on the Twitch channel, although I believe after a set amount of time, I think Twitch deletes them. But yeah, I'm going to try to put these on YouTube and stuff. Counterpoint Bobby, literally barfed up by a clown. Oh yeah, Bobby's colorful. I almost wanted him to be a bit more of a, a bit more of like, like colorful action going on, especially because his personality is pretty straightforward, pretty mundane. So it's like we had to, we had to jazz him up a little bit. <laughs> and no, I'm not sponsored by Sony. Did they, did Sony put something like in the middle of this stream? That would be weird. I feel like it'd be, I feel like if they're putting commercials on this, shouldn't I get money or something? Oh well. All right, like SpongeBob. Yeah, someone mentioned SpongeBob. That's another. Very simple, very memorable character. It's a he's a square. He's bright yellow with big googly eyes. You're not gonna forget SpongeBob. Uh, yeah, very very clear primary color, very clear primary personal emotional tone. So SpongeBob is another example of a successful memorable character. Whether or not you like that particular style, but he did the job. Uh, well drawn buffed character. Oh, thank you. If the first thing you see is a cliche, it can destroy the suspension of disbelief. Uh, yeah, sometimes. That's why, like, it, it's all down to exactly how it's executed. So uh, you can go in there with a bunch of stereotypes and wind up with something that is very bland. It's fully possible to do. But I know that most of what I see in writing circles is people railing against anything that they can even get a glimmer of recognition from regarding archetypes. So I'm just trying to emphasize that you can use, you know, you can use source material and archetypes and basic ideas, and um, you can use them poorly, but you can use them well too. So don't be afraid to use them, you know. Period. V's primary is pink. What shape is she? I would say V has got a lot of uh, a lot of spiky hair and ears and the tail going on. So her primary shaping characteristic, I'd see, would I would say would be. A little bit of the spikiness, and especially with uh, with the way her arms and legs work, with the kind of like the zigzaggy legs and the fur tufts on the back of the digitigrade legs. Yeah, she's she's kind of like an edgy, edgy, spiky, sort of shaping characteristics. Lots lots of elbows, lots of elbows in there. Uh, what makes you decide what boob size a female character should have? Um, I don't know. I just kind of play that by ear, I guess, based on what the character's body type is like and. Also, variation. I think that boob size is another good example of if you have a cast of characters, and you know there's a bunch of females, 
if all the girls have the exact same cookie cutter body. I mean, unless it's like uh, explicitly just like a cheesecake thing and it's all about like, oh, they're so sexy. If that's the case, it might not be that big of a deal to have variation, but even so, I don't know, if there's a bunch of female characters in a lineup, I feel like some variation makes things more interesting, more fun, so... Yeah, when it comes down to boob size, I guess it's down to just trying to go in the direction of what makes a character more individual and more themselves. Uh, any tips of character design in terms of anatomy? Um, not really any detailed ones that come to mind. My, my biggest tip would just be in terms of, like, having a general, like, a big picture direction with shaping characteristics and having a lot of uh, distinctive variation between characters in a lineup. But when it comes down to, like, exact details... Um, Excuse me. Yeah, I don't, I don't know if I if any, if I have anything brilliant springing to mind regarding like distinctive anatomy. Another question: What makes you decide the animal a dreamkeeper should be? That one actually varies. Like sometimes we will go into a character based on an animal because we're like, oh, we haven't done this type of a character yet. We haven't done I don't know like a lynx or a bobcat, and then we'll go in and start designing bobcat characters. And sometimes during that process, the personality will sort of emerge. And then sometimes it's the opposite. Sometimes we have a very clear personality in mind and a very clear role in the story. And then we're like, oh, well, we have the personality. We've got this character here. What animal would best reflect it? And so, yeah, we've, we've sort of approached it from both ends at various times. Uh, what about Bobby? His design is far from simple. Why does he clash so much? Because uh, he's a party animal. Speaking of complex, who is the most complex character in the Dreamkeeper's universe? Um... I'm not really sure, because it's difficult to answer that without knowing what kind of complexity you mean. Like, if it's just visual complexity, I'd have to scroll through a lineup, or emotional personality complexity. Yeah, so I guess I don't have a good answer to which is most complex. What is the design history behind Anise? Any link with Absinthe, a.k.a. the Green Fairy, which encompasses the color, name, and look of Anise? I don't think I was uh, consciously inspired by Absinthe, but it might have, I mean, it might have been subconscious. I see, you know, shows and movies and media, and Sometimes things filter through and come out, and you don't exactly know where it came from. But, yeah, with Anise, we just wanted another character who, who looked like she could be the sister to Sage, but a little bit a little bit different, and a little more, uh, I don't know, a little more, like, frail and also pointy. And the green color, along with, like, the blonde hair, seemed like a good direction to go, because we didn't have anyone with that color combo in the series yet. Uh, Vathiel confirms two weeks, then Twitch deletes it, so, but again, this should be on YouTube and stuff. Uh, what about character design in terms of clothing? I would say in terms of clothing, sometimes you want to have something very distinctive, like with Bast, uh, his red scarf is a big part of his visual design, and uh, it is part of his backstory as well, so it's not there just for no reason, but even so, that's an example of clothing incorporated in the character design that is, yeah, visually a big part of it. Someone said, Igreth was once a bear, right? It's like, yeah, actually, initially... When I was doing the lineup, I wanted to have, you know, the kid characters, and I wanted to have a big protector, like a big sort of a bear type of personality. So originally, in the earliest concept art, Agrath was kind of like this big bear character. And I think that was also inspired a lot by uh, the Golden Compass, because that had a big bear character, if I remember. That I think I was reading that around the same time. But, um, I don't know, as we were going, I thought that a big bear, like, it fit, but it seemed a little typical. It didn't quite seem to have what we were going for so we tried other we tried a bunch of other animals i think we even tried a doberman pincher for igrath at one point and just started like rolling things out to see what fits what doesn't and we wound up thinking oh well, actually if we make him sort of like an eagle character it looks really cool and we we left some of the bear in there like if you look at his if you look at his hands with those big claws and you look at his feet so he's kind of like a bear eagle griffin type of thing uh he says i was referring to personality complexity like dr houses or tony stark's Hmm. In terms of complex personality, I don't know. I actually think we might be possibly Igrath. Like Igrath seems pretty happy and go lucky and like, oh, I'm Uncle Igrath, haha, -ha, on the surface. But he's got some he's got some stuff under the surface that will emerge later on that I think is interesting. What about the villains like Nabonidus and Void? Yeah, Nabonidus and Void are fun. Nabonidus especially. There's a character design story with him. Initially, when I was working with my initial partner, we were talking about, oh, we need a villain. And the first cookie cutter villain that I put out there that I was, you know, the, the idea that we had together was sort of like an anime villain. So he came out looking pretty much like a knockoff of Sephiroth from Final Fantasy VII. And again, that was in my sketchbook. And the more I looked at that, the more I thought, well, this looks like 
every anime villain that I've ever seen, he looks very, very much like an anime villain. It's like, I think we took the nose off him because it's in the dream world, but that, that sure is an anime villain. He sure is handsome with, you know, long hair in the front, and he's very grim and tall. And So, I don't know. I wasn't happy with that, and I wanted to make something that was more distinctive, more... I don't know, it's just something that made him seem more exotic and menacing and alien. And so I wound up taking, you know, I took some of the original idea of like, oh, a villain was sort of like, like, he's still tall. He still has like quite the quite the shoulder width. But then we went in a direction where I, I hid all of his body because it's so emaciated. And it's hidden behind all those white robes. So he's almost just like goes around like a column. And then like the armor plating and especially the elaborate head thing kind of comes from, I was trying to think about where did this guy come from? It's like, well, he used to be worshipped as a god, so gods tend to be pretty melodramatic. They're going to have like pretty elaborate stuff and pretty elaborate headgear. and So yeah, and I think I got a lot of inspiration too from, um, uh, who's the creator who did Xenomorphs? I'm having a brain fart, but you know the, the artist, especially if you look up their stuff, H.R. Geiger. I got some inspiration from H.R. Geiger, and I thought it'd be cool to bring shaping characteristics like that into, into play. So, and then instead of having it just be like a total xenomorph head where it's like sort of a phallic uh, symbol, I wanted it instead to be more of like a starburst, more, you know, coinciding with like the, the pieces coming off his armor and the shoulder pieces and then the headpiece crowning the whole thing. So it's like if you took the H.R. Geiger-esque sort of shaping characteristics and then applied it to the most exaggerated crown you could conceive of and added all of this like shoulder stuff to make it like a starburst that centers on... Uh, the face of this god character and that's where Nabonidus comes from and Nabonidus put a lot of thought into his outfit and then as Zygomard 17 has, uh, has notified Nabonidus is a spiky dildo Nabonidus put all that thought into his look and then Ravat just calls him uh, the great white dildo so <laughs> even even in fiction you cannot escape glib observations all right so I guess uh, it looks like we have reached the end of the questions for now. So thank you, everyone, for coming in and watching this panel on character design for CouchCon. I hope some of this is handy, just to recap. Uh, simple, generally, especially if it's a main character, simpler is better. A lot of detail can often serve to clutter it up and water it down and make so it's harder for people to remember what the character is like, even if they want to do fan art or something. So more details, not always better. If there's details there, make sure the details are there for a reason and they're doing something to support who the character is and what they do. Um, especially when you're designing a cast, you want to have variation. You want to have characters look distinct from one another. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, remember the general idea of primary, counterpoint, and accent because that, you know, just as a general idea that comes in handy across the board. And you want to have distinct uh, different colors, shapes, personalities and then shape and personality overlap in posture so yeah thank you everybody for watching i hope you have a fantastic night and we'll be back with some more see you then